Wow. Well, that makes me feel sort of like chat GPT isn't going to take my job just yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's really not. People are freaking out about that, though. You know, it's, yeah, it is my eternal curse that I get asked about chat GPT and therapy. I yeah. would imagine. 600 reasons it's chill. Can you give us like one or two? The amount of, the amount of non confidential I mean, it's just like, and all of that stuff already has rolled out. Like, if we're going to swap the digital component, fine. But, like, AI therapy for working poor people has been the goal since 1966. <laughs> it's an right. old panic. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing about panics, right? They are mostly- As we see. Well, I think people are really, people are really sort of up in arms about you know, the general pressures of like productivity and efficiency, both like in academic labor and in therapeutic labor. And that's really what they're so anxious about is like, how do, how do, how do you do, how do you do the labor of doing either of those things when uh, the costs, like when cost efficient solutions to that, that involve AI and they involve technology seem to be like, you know, stealing your jobs. I put that in quotes, but you know, it's, I think that's really what people are anxious about is how to contend with that, with those pressures, which is not like a therapeutic. I mean, it's a therapeutic problem, but it's not a therapeutic answer. Yep. I mean, I think from, I, I just from my position, like within the humanities, there's, I mean, besides the like crisis in the humanities, which has been going on for however long, um, there's also just this sort of sense of like, how can we keep doing this thing that no one wants? Um, mm-hmm. And that part of the the um, concern about chat GPT is it's just a sort of like crystallization of the like, no one wants to do this kind of writing. Right. And so like the, the endeavor like has to require some sort of good faith. And like the idea that like there's more and more bad faith making its way into like the classroom it's like it's like an already crumbling endeavor starts to crumble even more i don't know that's my that's my like really off the cuff kind of version are we ready to talk about why freud is back yeah totally Listening to Ordinary Unhappiness, a podcast about psychoanalysis, politics, pop culture, and the ways we suffer now. I'm Abby Kluchin. I'm Patrick Blanchfield. And today we are joined uh, by two of our, our favorite people um, who are also, you know, stuck in a transfer- transferential relationship to the field of psychoanalysis, um, just like we are, Hannah Zeven and Alex Colston. Uh, Hannah and Alex, I mean, you're going to learn a lot about Hannah and Alex in the next hour, but uh, they are, among many other things, the co-founders of the Psychosocial Foundation and editors of Parapraxis magazine. Um, So welcome, Hannah and Alex. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Hello. Before we get into like the question of of the hour, the 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 why is why is Freud back? Why why is psychoanalysis back? And you know, I know that both of you have actually been like we ha- we had to start a magazine and an organization to figure this out. Um, so we're not going to like sort it all out today. But I thought we could talk a little bit, um, and this is a question for for everybody here about your own the the ways that you've made how you've made your way into psychoanalysis. Like what was your path to psychoanalysis specifically and what kind of role does it play in your life, in your work, whether that's academic work or or activist work, in in your thought, in your relationships, in your politics, like take this in in whatever direction you want. My path to psychoanalysis, I think, came out of a kind of personal frustration with editing history books, I think, and politics books. Um, I used to do that. 
and I still edit books, but I think when I was really in it and I was really doing a lot of work with historians, um, I would always find myself like asking people who were writing about the past to tell me like, why does this matter right now? Why does, um, why did this, why does this history of the democratic party or this history of labor politics or whatever, it doesn't matter what the topic was, how, what's the import? How do you, how do you take it up? Um, and I found myself like more and more drawing upon psychoanalysis as a way to make sense of how the president has lived, I guess, or taken up or imported and that it wasn't actually a straightforward process that in fact, it involved mechanisms like repression, screen memory, fantasy, defense, um, things that historians do and do not articulate um, whether or not they know it. And I think getting clear for myself about how the meaning of history is questioned and taken up required something like a psychical understanding. And I think it also helped me think about, you know, something that Jody Dean once pointed out in one of her books, which is that once upon a time on the left, you'd have notions that the personal is political, which would, which involved certain kinds of mediations to get you from the personal to the political. And that she says that there has been kind of a perverse inversion of that, which is that the political has become personal, which is to say anything that happens politically is just a personal matter. And that's not quite what the original slogan meant. And it's not quite, um, and, it, and in fact, it, in a way, it kind of erases a lot of the psychical work of how you get from the immediate and the personal to a political structure or question. And so I've also, at the same time, I'm wondering like, okay, well, how does, how does one take up history in the past? It's not as simple as just saying it's a personal matter that attracts you, that affects you and directs you immediately, that there's some kind of mediative work between the personal and the political. And it seemed to me that psychoanalysis had a better and more robust framework to understand the mechanisms involved in that. And so that's like an intellectual reason why I got into it. I mean, I think there are personal reasons too, which are more complicated, but it's I mean, around just like trying to live an efficient, productive life in my twenties and realizing, oh, I can't actually do that. I can't actually live up to that. And the frustrations involved in that led me to psychoanalysis more like personally and working through those kind of things. But some mixture of all of that kind of led me to think about psychoanalysis, both like personal struggles and then also like intellectual puzzles. I have a, I think a, a much more boring answer. I doubt that. Um, I mean, I, I was raised by and in the theory. My parents are analysts, as are most of their friends. I am, a, you know, a classic shrink kid. I grew up at the adult end of the dinner table with adults, some of whom were child analysts. Uh, and when I got picked up from school early, I would nap on an analytic couch and play with Rorschach cards and things like this and learned about Dora at age 10 um, and didn't really care personally, like the same way you can inherit a parental religion and kind of end up an atheist. Um, you know, you're raised in for me being Jewish also, but yeah, <laughs> but then that changed um, and it changed in that kind of classic object refound rediscovery that Freud himself describes. I had, had a whole life, young life as a poet, a very committed life um, and was presented with mourning and melancholia kind of incidentally like to the side of trying to think through some of the same questions Alex has just named. I was looking as one of these historians who needed to describe that, that shift between the personal register and the political register, looking at Vietnam War veterans returning home from the war who are making artworks when the VA couldn't see them in treatment and um, read Morning and Melancholia and just got that feeling that I had up to then reserved for poetry of needing to understand something so badly that I felt I could dedicate my life in that direction. And then from there, it was an open question, would I train or not? And I decided not to train, but to become a historian of the thing 
in in a way, if we believed in accidents, which we don't, <laughs> would be ac- an accidental way um, and be, become a historian of the thing that in part had made me. And that that has been my work since. No randomness in psychic life. House no rules. randomness in psychic life. Yeah. Um, Patrick, I'm going to ask you the same question too, because we haven't had a chance to actually get into this. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll be schematic and quick about it, but, uh, will you, I mean, I can try, I, I, I particularly I, much more interesting what <laughs> Anna and, and Alex have to say, but I, yeah, for me, I, I, I wasn't a child of therapist. In, in fact, I, I, I don't think psychological matters or questions of like interiority in that way had much truck in the environment I grew up in. In fact, I was raised Catholic, right? And so a lot of these, uh, a lot of the discourse surrounding um, internal mental life was surrounded by either dynamics of sin or atonement or, you know, like it, it's Easter. So this is all very overdetermined today in particular for me. But like, uh, I think, I think for me coming to psychoanalysis happened when I was like maybe 13, 14. It was definitely somewhere late in my freshman year of high school and uh, beginning of my, my sophomore year, I think perhaps that summer. Uh, where I came across some Freud in a in a library it was and it was I think it was the the modern library edition that like old uh, the the Brill translation one right and it included all the interpretation of dreams and some other stuff and I remember reading that and again at this time I was uh, very lucky to be receiving a, a really on scholarship for the record I should say this is, there's some class stuff going on here too but like a really exquisite Jesuit education right and so we were learning Latin and Greek and. I just had this exposure to like modernism. And I remember like taking out the T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland and like opening all these books next to it to like, be, oh, there are references here, right? And we were somehow encountering uh, these sort of like thickets of of dense texts producing meaning that could send you on these kind of tangents to look into things. And, and, and then I found this book of Freud's and there was something about uh, both stylistically and in terms of content that it had done nothing there was nothing else I'd read quite like it, like the way it interwove, uh, and particularly those people who have read the the, the first several books of, of, of the dream book may, may recall this, right? There are all these like references to dreams in the classical tradition or dreams that, you know, people were having in, in, in the French belletristic tradition, et cetera. And it, it, there was something about the, the, the sheer diversity of different stories and voices that were happening in this text that was also about sort of finding meaning from them. And that, of course, you know, touched on these, uh, was suffused with like this the question of sexuality, right? Which is, of course, you know, interesting if you're you're 13 or 14. Uh, and uh, it, it just became this kind of tantalizing reservoir of meaning making. And I, I don't think I've ever really stopped reading Freud since that. I mean, it then went into grad school and, you know, and, well, college, grad school, like very invested in Freudian literary criticism. But then finally, by the time I got into uh, in grad school and, and had an experience of, fiction basically being murdered for me, like killing the pleasure of doing it. I, I have a very hard time reading fiction now as a result of that. I did also did like clinical stuff. I did four years of training in that. And I think it, it, kind of paradoxically, it was in clinical case conferences that I rediscovered some of the stuff that I had lost in terms of my attention to fiction and the meaning making in that. Like I found people like struggling to care for one another and like threshing through problems of existence and loneliness and loss and mourning and desire and all that stuff in a way that was much more vivid and earnest than what was happening in like my theory courses back on like the main campus as opposed to the medical school one. And uh, I don't know that that kind of reaffirmed me in a certain commitment to the discipline and to the way of uh, way of to the stance or, or body of knowledge that is psychoanalysis. So yeah, that's me. Abby, can I throw this question on you now? Sure. Although I, I feel like I don't, I don't know if I have as good of an answer as, uh, as anybody here. Um, like Alex, I, I came to, to thinking with and about psychoanalysis in my twenties. I was in, when I was in graduate school. Um, I, I mean, I definitely, I have like, I was actually teaching Freud last week and I've like come across all of this like nasty undergraduate marginalia. <laughs> like when I was like, fuck you, you misogynistic asshole. Um, but in, I, I wrote a dissertation about um, Lucy Gray and Julia Kristeva and like speaking about, you know, we're going to get into things like, you know, academic or, or intellectual trends. And like, those are two thinkers who are like very much like not in anymore at all. Um, but they are also, in addition to being um, 
linguists and philosophers, they're they're practicing psychoanalysts. So in order from from there, because I was really interested in a set of questions about feminist philosophy, I ended up making my way backwards to Lacan. And then because, you know, you know, Lacan always was like, you know, you guys can be Lacanians, like I'm a Freudian. Like I made my way backwards to to Freud. And you know, when I was in graduate school, I actually like <laughs> I used to go to the Union Theological Seminary Library, which is which is uh, at Columbia or at the the theological seminary that's that's uh, attached to Columbia, and uh, no one else used to take out the standard edition. <laughs> so mm. I would like be I was like hoarding in my like tiny little like Queen's apartment. I was like hoarding all of these uh, copies of the standard edition, and then like occasionally being like at war with somebody who would like fi- like recall one of them finally. Um, but I don't know, Alex was talking, and, and so was Hannah, we're talking about the, the the personal and the political. I think for me, the thing where I've gotten kind of stuck with psychoanalysis, like, and I mean that in a positive sense, is like, it's it's in the intellectual and the visceral register, and it's always toggling back and forth between those two things. But at this point, I feel like my... My work, which I see as, I mean, it's writing, but it's in, 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 in a real way, it's teaching. Like that's like this space in which I think I, I, I do something real in, the, in this world. Like I, I don't know that I could be an effective teacher without understanding the classroom like as like, I don't know, like a Winnicottian kind of play space or as also a place where like affects need to be contained and also like um, let to emerge. So I, I don't know. It's. I guess I don't even know that I could like talk to Patrick without like, could we even have a conversation without talking yeah. about psychoanalysis? Like, have we? <laughs> I, it's definitely like in the, the ambient atmosphere or, or it's a set of references that are. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, so let's, but let's, let's turn to like the, the question of the day, um, which, which is, I don't know. It is a question of intellectual and academic trends, but I think it's also much more than that. Um, why do we all think that Freud or psychoanalysis is back? Well, actually, I was maybe even to stitch together the questions when you were all talking. I was reminded that when I was in seventh grade or eighth grade, um, I had my first encounter with reading Freud and the class was on introspection. Uh, that was the name of the class. And, um, and I remember thinking at the time, you know, the teacher was talking explicitly about sex and, you know, I was like 13 years old, you know, 13, 14 years old. And it felt like it was one of the first moments where I was like learning something that was visceral in the way that you just uh, mentioned, Abby. And it was relevant Mm -hmm. to like being an adolescent and like, you know, going through puberty and like, in like suddenly my body has a presence and my emotional life is confusing and my, you know, my, uh, my thoughts and and dreams are weird to me and it's strange to me. And it was more, even though it was like in the truncated form of like a Florida political, political and public education, you know, with all of the kind of pressures of that. And and there has a resonance right now where like public education in Florida is being truncated and like, you know, uh, sort of like, you know, essentially like, I mean, to put it vulgarly, like neutered and depoliticized, like encountering Freud in that, in the Florida public school system, even just, even if it was just like a thumbnail sketch, provided a more robust language to describe my lived experience of being an adolescent than anything else. And I think to the extent that, you know, there's like a sanitized public discourse around things that are complicated, sex, trauma, you know, the lived life of of a body, the lived life of like social relations that are in turmoil and complicated, like Freud for better or for worse, like can get you to a conversation about those things in language that is more probing and deep and, and clarifying than a lot of other things on offer. And I think psychoanalysis for its party is so far as it's been sort of both promulgated and generalized, but also kind of repressed and sort of truncated, you know, it kind of always can be called up as a touchstone of getting at those complicated things that are otherwise very hard to talk about. 
And so I think even just looking back on that memory, you know, it wasn't a lot. I didn't get it like a, like a, you know, comprehensive education about Freud, but even then just like hearing those theories at a time in which I was, in which I was living, you know, beyond the latency period, <laughs> my childhood <laughs> and getting some way to articulate that was, was good for me. And I think to some extent, I think that's part of the answer is that like actually things that are censored out of public discourse, Freud has a name for why that happens, you know, and has, and can articulate the process of that. I have a little bit more incredulity about the Freud return, both because I think Freud never left. Yeah. I think there's been a falling away and a coming back to, mm-hmm. I think Alex probably agrees with Alex. Like, like, yeah. So I'm not positioning us against each other, but more credulity, incredulity say than the New York times. In part because, I love this, a colleague of mine after the New York Times wrote Freud is back, baby, you know, which is fun to say. Like, I I don't doubt that. You know, it's like the New York Times wrote Freud is back, baby, in 2018. And the New Yorker had a similar piece, I think, also that year. So it's four years ago. So Freud is back from where and from when, I think, is really an important part of this. Um, For all the reasons that Alex is describing, you know, right, Freud gives us the language of remembering to forget to remember. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can't disappear something that hasn't been worked through. It will only rise on today, Easter. Mm -hmm. And I think (laughs) Freud is in a kind of perpetual, you know, being killed off and re-rising since his own parlor with his young, you know, comrades in arms in in thinking psychically who also tried to kill him, right? Freud tells us this will happen and it does. Um, It's kind of a, if you see the Buddha on the road thing going on here. Yeah. So, but then why now? Because there is some re-rising happening now, or at least we're being told there is. So I think we can take that seriously enough. Um, Or just even on our part, why did I say to Alex, hey, do you want to make a psychoanalytic magazine? Alex said, let me think about it for a week. Alex thought about it for a day. <laughs> and like since in 18 months, spent like every single day working on this thing for free all the time. Why did we do that? Um, I think there are a lot of reasons. Like one, one thing has to do with the fact that psychoanalysis doesn't condescend. Or this is another Jackie Rose quote, a Jacqueline Rose quote, you know, which is that the unconscious can't condescend. And that to have a theory as complex as we are and as the world is that takes really seriously suffering, that can braid, even though it's a failed braiding, right? Failure is not only bad, it can be productive with marks so that we can really see like all of human suffering at once, a a unified theory of unhappiness, not, not so ordinary, but also ordinary, I think is really crucial to not feel condescended to, because I think basically the other theories for emotional life are incredibly condescending in the United States, right? You can just solve your stuff very easily and quickly. What is wrong with you? And you can either feel like something's wrong with you or that the thing wasn't explained easily enough. And so I think psychoanalysis, like it offers that more complicating political for Alex at the top of the hour, also offers that to individuals. Um, and uh, yeah, and and because it never went away. Um, other people, you know, have ventured, and I think this is important, you know, that we've just lived through a completely disavowed mass trauma. So, you know, Freud might, might his, his specter might rise again there. Um, you know, other people have gestured to the kind of twin collapses really specifically of CBT as answer and yeah. only psychological drugs as answer. We're seeing like, psychedelics are rising again too, right? It's not just Freud that's returned. I think it's all of these other ways of exploring that are complicated and less one dimensional than you shall be cured and that kind of edict. When you were talking, you reminded me of when I was, when I was in my twenties, I went to, I did a course of CBT, um, like, you know, 12 weeks. I had a mild case of, uh, OCD and I was like, oh, I know what this is. <laughs> I should go, <laughs> I should go do CBT. And, uh, at a certain point, the the person I was seeing was just like, you're like, you're giving me nothing. <laughs> like, and I was like, I like finally got upset. And I was like, because you have such an impoverished conception of human subjectivity that I feel like profoundly insulted by what we're doing here. And she was like, oh, okay. 
<laughs> I mean, and that's not to say that CBT is not ever the right thing. Right? right? No, but it totally it helped. Like it. But it was like, yeah. I, I mean, it helped. Like, I, I no longer have to like make sure the door is locked like ten times, <laughs> and that's great. But at the same time that I was like doing those exercises, I was like, I am. I really feel like condescended to. Um, like as, as a complex being (laughs) who's being made out to be like this kind of like flattened robot, like not a subject. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, on both of those points, I mean, I think Freud does offer a way and psychoanalysis offers a way to, to say to patients and, um, to the public that there's dignity in psychical pain and that there's actual dignity and ugly thoughts and ugly feelings and things that bedevil you and you know you can't quite give an account for you can't but that you know psychoanalysis for its part you know does give you the time at least it ought to um to be able to articulate those things um that are not just simply matters of behavioral adjustments or nudges or and those things might help and they, in fact, do index real psychical problems, like behavioral problems do yeah. index psychical problems. But the extent to which you are you are or are not able to articulate them um, is a is a problem for for a person um, for oneself. And I think dig, I think psychoanalysis does try to dignify that struggle as like legitimate. And if there are all of these mass political reasons for why it's happening, there are also these more, you know, uh, textured and nuanced ways in which they're lived. That's much more harder to get a handle on, um, in day-to-day life. I had a friend say recently about this, having done CBT now has been an analysis for many years and that his feeling was what in making the switch. And of course, all of this is happening in a material world where you can afford to make the switch or someone has you know, offered you a very rare low fee spot or because there is no insurance parity really for mental health in this country, et cetera. But he described it as CBT got me out of bed. Right. I, and then what? And then I had to live out of bed. Like, right. you know, that that there's the dignity, but it's also like at what level is redress coming? And, you know, CBT, the way it clocks to and gets and gets grafted onto and through you know, whether you want to, the neoliberal late stage capital, right? All of these words being not specific enough. Get, the preparation for going back to work is what getting out of bed is. And it doesn't mean that it's not you know, a great feeling to be able to get out of bed, but but then you have to be in your head all day long and your body and and your your body being really part of also how we experience our minds. And psychoanalysis, I think, still has you know, in its very first contribution that to offer. Um, yeah, I found, I found the rose, but we don't have to return. Just so she, she describes fascism as a collective seizure of unconscious drives. Yeah. And that to be living through that moment of a collective seizure of unconscious drives. You know, Alex invokes Florida, you know, we're in, we're in, we're past the, the collective seizure. We're now living in the aftermath of that story in many ways. But she says like psychoanalysis gives us the way to understand fantasy operating inside that historical process. And, you know, if you're in the middle of a collective seizure, in her words, you might want to know something about it. Yeah, yeah I, th- I think tying together these things, uh, there's something about the, on the one hand, like the resurgence of I- ideo- ideological or political, like, quote unquote, isms that one might have thought say in the late nineties or early two thousands had been banished to the past on the one hand. And on the other hand, like the, the way in which psychoanalysis dignifies or at least is attuned to suffering in an attentive way rather than disavowing it or just pretending it's not there. I I think for me that those two things speak in different dimensions to like why, to the extent to which Freud can be said to be back you know, given that he never went away, I'm with Stanley Fish on this, right? Freud is dead because Freud is everywhere, I think, is, is the fish line. Uh, it, it's between those two dimensions, like suffering and a certain, t- like you can relate to suffering in a productive way, or at least there's something that can be gained from that insightfully. 
that also does work vis-a-vis like navigating the return of these what we could call like meta narratives, right? And just to gloss that for people who are listening, like a meta narrative is it's a term from like the postmodern sort of like culture wars, right? But like the idea that there are these grand explanatory stories for why the world is the way it is and where the world is going. And I, I feel very much like psychoanalysis, which is a it, many things, right? And, and and not just in Freud, but but is, you know, a sort of a humbled science that has claims to scientific accuracy, but then has been sort of like undone on those terms, but then aspects of it may be coming back. It, it also has had its waxing and waning as therapeutic praxis. And it, it, its history is very much inscribed with the 20th century's like traumas and diasporas of people, you know, fleeing their homelands and starting new traditions and new languages and new places, but also having to deal with the baggage that they brought with them or that it's being uh, reduplicated in their new homes. I think psychoanalysis has traction for that, right? And I'll be a little more sort of concrete about this. I, I think, and and this is more broadly why I think psychoanalysis is useful, right? I think two things can be true at the same time, and saying that one thing is is true is not to the exclusion of the other thing, right? I, I think there is a way in which a, one of the big meta narratives of the late of the '90s and then of the early 2010s was this idea that sort of things were getting better or that there was a necessary logical progression to uh, social welfare or the prog- the triumph of democracy or the ability of information exchange on the internet to be necessarily liberatory, et cetera, right? And I think, obviously, that that wasn't the case, right? But but I do think... Pinker was wrong. Yeah, Pinker, Pinker's always been wrong, and he, he doesn't even... I won't even start on that. He doesn't even read primary source material when he writes about psychoanalysis. He reads like. Okay. Part. Okay. Yeah. I won't even get into that. Like, um, <laughs> sorry. No, I shouldn't have opened okay. up that no, can of worms. It, but, but to, to the point in question, right. It, it's, I think the Trump years in particular, and of course this is also true again, nothing on both two things can be true, right? Like um, American society was absolutely fucking bonkers under the Bush administration and in the immediate aftermath of nine 11. And it was absolutely fucking bonkers during the Trump era. And there, there are ways in which they were different, but also like there are ways in which they were the same. Right. But I think one thing that that Trump did was make it impossible in polite society to maintain certain pretenses, or at least it exposed the way in which certain types of pretenses, um, or another term that came up a few minutes ago, like this, like condescension, like how vain that was, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I, I mean, I specifically go back to like these two elements in the uh, during the debates between Obama and Romney and then some of the debates involving Trump respectively it sort of like really crystallizes for me. I, I don't know if people recall this, but there was a, a period of time in, uh, I think it was the second Obama election when he was running against Romney, right? right um, where there was a lot of debate sequences. And again, like I'm watching this like in grad school with a very psychoanalytic ends, uh, like lens. So like when, you know, at the end of the debate, like all their wives and kids come on and they embrace, I'm like, why the fuck are they there? Like, they're showing us that they're virile and straight and they socially reproduce in the right way. Like, like wonderful. Like this is an absurd sort of uh, showing and telling all at once. But for people who remember some of the debates between Obama and Romney, it came down to like the question of like, who was going to have the strongest military and specifically the Navy. Does anyone remember this? Right? Like this is something you've heard me do this shit before and I'm sorry. But it was like, the question was, who was going to outdo the other in investing in the U.S. Navy, right? <laughs> and, and it was a back and forth for multiple debates. And, and never mind the fact that the Navy in particular during this period had actually, in one of those rare instances where the military industrial complex shows some kind of restraint, had actually said it didn't need more money, right? And like the military industrial complex, like we can't spend all this. We have to our, our new like destroyers are, 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 are very cool looking, but they don't work. Like we don't need this money during these debates with Romney and, and Obama. Th- nonetheless, they kept on coming back to who wanted the bigger, stronger Navy, who wanted more battleships, right? Who was going to have, and I, I got to tell you, it was all about hardening these boats. Like who has the more hardened military, right? Who has this, the longest battleships, which battleships are bustling with, with seamen that are ready to like impose our will. Like, again, it was really, it, 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 I, I was like squirming watching this. Cause I'm like, it, this is a giant exercise in dick measuring. Right. It, it felt, it, you know, the vulgar psychoanalysis was like, was like I was trying to say to, vulgar you know, Freudianism. Yeah. It was, it, was like, it was like bursting out of my chest. Right. And then. I, Phrasing. Yeah. Like a couple of years later, right. Donald Trump in the debates, like literally someone, there was people were talking about the size of his hands. Right. I mean, my man was literally like, well, actually, no, there's no problems down there. And he made a gesture to like indicate what the size of his penis was supposed to be. Right. He just went out and said it. 
and there was something about that where it was like what previously had been barely latent, right, implicit in the political dynamics was now being literally like thrown out on the table in front of you, right? Mm-hmm. And you, you had to, you couldn't deny it, right? Much in the same way as you couldn't deny other things that, for example, I think a lot of people who were invested in meta narratives of progress or of democracy necessarily producing the best outcomes, et cetera, uh, were used to be invested in, or at least could pretend that they were saying, right? You, you could hypothetically be like, well, Obama and Mitt Romney represent the both the best of two possible ways of organizing things, right? Or you could be like, at least they're very educated and sophisticated people, right? You can make these sort of appeals. Whereas what the Trump phenomena did for a lot of people, and I think this was just giving back to people what the system always had, right? Were things like the fact that racism doesn't go away. Right. Mm. If we repress it hard enough or if we wait for certain people to die. In fact, what if there is a pleasure in being racist for some people? What if we need to account for what's the emotional work or like the, the dividends, the pleasures of being a bigot? Right. These are things that have not been erased by the natural progression of like the winnowing sheath of progress or whatever the fuck. Right. And at that point, a lot of the social gestures of being like, well, no, this isn't what this is, right? This has to be something else. You are the one making this vulgar. They kind of fell by the wayside. Like you can't keep up. I'm not saying people aren't still doing this, right? Mm. But you couldn't, you couldn't keep up with the pretense or the way in which the pretense was patronizing became undeniable. And I think that for me has been very, very clarifying in terms of just thinking about why this stuff is back, right? It, it, Freud is arguably back in this way, in the same way like Marx is back, right? L- like l- the, 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 these ticks we have conversationally, and you'd have to use a lot more in earlier moments. Well, I'm not a Freudian, but this debate between Obama and Romney seems very gendered to me, right? Or it, we'd be like, well, I'm not a Freudian in the sense that you'd have to be appealing to some caricature. Like, well, I don't believe everything is about penises, but goddamn, this is really about penises here, right? That is rings to me in the same way in which like Marx is like, like, I'm not a Marxist, but it seems like inequality is out of control, right? Or I'm not a Marxist, but the fact that, you know, uh, child mortality in the U.S. is only rising seems like a concern, right? You no longer have to make these gestures, but the, or I don't think you do, but the very fact that those gestures sort of exist points to the fact that whatever is, whatever the insights or at least the the things that a figure like Marx or Freud can stand for as one of these famous masters of suspicion, or at least as indexing a whole perspective on, on the world, that that hasn't, there's a residuum or something in their insight that has traction in the present. And you have to deal with it much of the same way as you have to deal with these other things that they clarify. You can't just wish them dead or I, ritually slay them. I, I think yeah. there's the, the latent manifest distinction, which I, I guess I'm thinking about it from, Freud's interpretation of dreams, um, like the latent psychical material, which is like what the dream is is actually about, as opposed to um, the manifest, which is like all of the confusing shit that like you wake up and you're like, what? Um, but I mean, I don't know. It's interesting, Patrick. Like, I, I hear you saying like, on the one hand, like there's no longer subtext. It's just text, <laughs> right? Like, but on the other hand, I, I hear you saying something like, the latent manifest distinction is as, as a mode of interpreting it, it's, it gives you, it cashes out um, to return to a previous conversation as something like what is on display is not at all. What's, what's actually at work. Right. Um, so like I'm, I'm thinking, I'm still thinking about politics, but I'm, I'm thinking about um, um, just like the degree of polarization that, that, that we have to, and, and, and I think this relates to, to what Hannah was talking about, both about like the sort of lack of condescension, but also like what is a theory that is proper to the genuine complexity of humans, right? But like what is the conception of selfhood that is proper to a time when we, collect, when we collectively decide like I literally cannot understand like half of the people in the country that, that I live in. Like I truly cannot imagine myself into them and maybe I'm just going to decide that because I can't do that, I just hate them. That is a moment when I think like psychoanalytic um, cultural mm-hmm. criticism can can flourish. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think kind of 
just to respond to both of those statements, I mean, I think the political in all of its ways kind of um, arrogates itself on like a consistent self-presentation. Like, you know who you are, you know what you believe in, you know what your values are, you know, you know who you want to vote for. And I think in the kind of like, you know, in the generalized, you know, incapacity of political society in the United States to deliver a livable life to most people, there's confusions and frustrations in that that come out. Um, And I think where, you know, yourself as a political subject have to struggle with like an inconsistency about your person, about what you want and about your desires and about what kind of world you want to live in and who you want to live in it with. And those bring up psych- psych- psychological problems um, you know, that can be, you know, as it were, psychoanalyzed. But I think just the lived reality of being confused about how um, the material structures of your life don't actually deliver the adapt- adaptational, efficient subject you can be in, in your working life or in your social life. I mean, when, the, when you come up against struggles in that register... You know, you want for a language to give you some understanding of that. And I think into into Pat's points too, like, you know, as vulgar and idiotic as political discourse can be, it's nonetheless extremely signifying in precisely the ways that are like psychoanalytic, because psychoanalysis pays attention to idiotic speech in, in the sense, yeah. in like the etymological sense, it's private, you know, like suddenly there's these sort of private meanings that suddenly have great traction and significance and traffic throughout our lives in the idiotic in the idiocy of it actually is extremely textured and meaningful and polysemous and like worth understanding. And to the extent that you can't repress the kind of polysemic particularity of one's own speech, it's also true in political discourse too, which tries to just dissolve all of, all of, private fantasy and um, enjoyment into a kind of like sanitized public speech, but it doesn't work. Actually, there are all these kind of like, there's this residuum as, as Pat puts it in, in public political speech that actually indicates something more excessive and confusing and um, uh, matters that are about libidinal economy, not necessarily, not just political economy. hoping that you could tell us a little bit about the origin. I mean, we've already been talking on this podcast about origin stories, um, but can you tell us a little bit about the origin story of Parapraxis and the Psychosocial Foundation? So maybe it's almost two years ago now, my stepfather was an analyst, was doxxed by the far right. Um, and then for he wrote a paper called On Having Whiteness. That is, I think by standards of the left and a not very provocative paper, even though he is a great writer. And so a lot of it's very arch Um, and parts of it are extremely moving. Starting to think about whiteness and how one acquires whiteness metaphorized. Yes. Like an illness that that has no cure, he says. And that was quite terrifying. And actually Alex and that's how I met Patrick as well. And first came into contact with Patrick. Um, And you know, there. I just had this feeling that there was not a place where one could explore so deeply what was happening there uh, or in anything like that. Um, that, yes, there were these one-off essays or if you are Jacqueline Rose or Adam Phillips and you have the London Review, that you can write a psychoanalytic essay, but that there was no popular idiom devoted to it and also devoted to it non dogmatically with no concern for its doxies, right? Like you could, you can publish in Lacanian ink, but there was no psychoanalysis ink, right? Um, and uh, Lacanian ink is a, is a journal, more of a journal, but a very prettily produced journal in New York, Lacanian circles, New York French. Um, and so as that felt more and more pressing in the aftermath of what had happened to Dawn, but had long been like a sadness for me, and I reached out to Alex um, to see if we might do it ourselves. Um, and I 
as I said at the top of the hour, I wrote to Alex and we have the, we have, it's very cute. Like we have the screenshot of the DM where Alex and I set a phone call um, for our very own, how it started, how it's going memes. Um, but Alex and I talked on the phone. We had never met in person. We had talked a lot about the problems of training to become an analyst in the U.S. We talked a lot about the problems of affording analysis in the U.S. And we talked a lot about psychoanalysis on the phone. This is during pandemic season one and two. And Alex said, I'll go talk to some friends. Alex was in New York. I was in Oakland. And I'll get back to you in a week. And Alex called me back the next morning. I was like, okay, it's a good idea. Let's do it. And that was like November, December 2021. And a year later, Parapraxis released its first issue. And in parallel, we made... I believe how fast you did that. <laughs> Neither can we. Yeah. But yeah, and in parallel, so we had to make a foundation. Like, right, we, we needed a nonprofit place to stick the money and we thought it would just be a shell. Um, but then we realized we had to afford the magazine. And one way we started to think about this is like, what if we actually took the remit of the magazine, which was an accessible kind of open access to analytic education and writing and did a kind of live version of it. Um, and so started running seminars on the theme of the magazine. So the magazine's first issue was on the family problem. Second issue coming out this summer on repair. We've had two such seminars. Um, completely sliding scale. Where it, as it's worked out, more than half the students are attending for free. Um, and, and then from there, the foundation has grown to include one-off events and book events and a, a lecture series on keywords in the psychosocial and uh, short courses on Klein and Beyond and Winnicott and Fanon. Um, but also really, you know, done this work of publishing a magazine. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that about covers it. I mean, you know, I was, um, for my part, I was finishing up a master's in psychoanalytic studies around this time. And I was also taking classes with Pat um at the Brooklyn Institute of Social Research and I had done that degree because I wanted to write more psychoanalytically and Pat's so good at it that it was uh convenient <laughs> um to take classes with him and yeah I mean I I you all think can't see Patrick's face I'm but blushing he's, he's yeah, blushing beat, beat red but thank you um I think you know it's been it's been a it's been a wild ride like doing the doing the foundation and doing the magazine um so quickly um and having so uh i think many people flock to the project and become part of the collective that makes it and i think what i've discovered since now i now i'm in a phd program to become a clinical psychologist and uh, when i work clinically i work psychoanalytically and and like actually being in that more immediate context of like doing psychoeducational work and like doing clinical work, I've actually come to realize more than I could have anticipated and more than I knew at the time that the psychosocial foundations work and the magazines work is really, really and truly speaking to particular problems in the field of clinical psychology and psychology generally that really is like where there are these like repressed problems in that world around material economy, race, gender, questions of embodiment and sexuality, which, and ironically, that is the purview of that world to think about how that affects you psychologically. But I'm actually surprised. And I mean, uh, like a little bit like, um, I'm, and whatever, I'm proud of the fact that the Psychosocial Foundation in its way has been not only supplemental to general like dominant predominant discourses around psychology but actually supplemental to the work that i do in that it it has a um has a lot of salience uh, for what we're trying to get people to talk about um even in the professional field that i'm in and it's like that's really cool um it's cool to sort of see that there's these institutional questions that are like that the foundation is addressing that I see in, in real time in clinical work and in the professional world of like American psychology. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been participating in, in these seminars since, since the beginning um, and occasionally being a facilitator for some of the small groups. And I have to say like one of the things that's been the most exciting for me is having, especially in this, I mean, throughout the whole thing, but 
but especially in some of these small groups, having clinicians and academics and people who are just like in the grip of a transferential relationship to psychoanalysis, like talk to each other in these different registers, which I guess is like the emerging theme of this episode. Um, Mm -hmm. But I also feel like one of the things, and Patrick sort of alluded to this earlier, is that something that the Psychosocial Foundation seems to be doing, and I realize that this this take on this is very much informed by like my own like you know professional orientation, is like it it feels in some ways like a return to like a earlier twentieth century intellectual problem, which is like how do we put Marx and Freud together? I mean, yeah, how how do we put Marx and Freud together? How do we think about black studies? How do we think about you know queer studies? How do we think about all of these sort of disparate disciplines and traditions and ways of getting at psychical life? How can we think them all together? And that has been, I think, I think that has been actually quite organic. Yeah. To like, like I and and it it wasn't by design, you know. It just those are the interlocutors that have like come to compose the work. And that has, and like, you know, questions of like, you know, you know, like, how do you take up feminism in the 21st century? That has like animated a lot of the work that we've done. Um, And it's just, those are the kind of people who are interested in psychoanalysis today. And so I guess part of the, why is Freud back question is like, for whom is that a meaningful question? And, and it seems to us that it, it is a question of like Freud and Marx, but it is a question of all these other sort of like, salient critical populations who are trying to make sense of the psychological difficulties around race, gender, sex, class, so on and so forth. Um, and that, and, and again, that's just been kind of organic. We, it wasn't by design. It was just like, what if you brought, if you brought Freud back, who follows? Well, actually all these people follow um, because it, because that vocabulary is relevant to those political struggles. Um, I had a question for, and, and Hannah, I think you've touched on this a little bit, but um, I loved, we both loved your, your essay in the, in the first volume of Parapraxis, which is also just like very beautiful, but your essay composite case, which is about children and analysis and children of analysts. And, and I know you alluded before to your own status as a, as a child and, and, and stepchild of analysts um, and uh, deciding to become a historian of, of the thing uh, rather than to be to, be, to go into analytic training. Can you tell us a little bit, especially with the creation of Parapraxis and, psycho, and the Psychosocial Foundation about what it's like to situate yourself in, in that lineage? Yeah, I mean, thank, thank you for another blush. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird thing. So, you know, the, the across the registers, right? On the one hand, because I'm a historian of the thing, in part because I find it really compelling how I find it really compelling and why is inextricable from the fact that it was the idiom in which I grew up. On the other hand, you know, I have brothers and they don't care that much, you know, so it's me. And I tried to think about that, which in part I think has to do with being a child, but also a stepchild. And so trying to, you know, what you don't have in blood, acquire an affinity and all these kinds of questions. Um, But also I've just found it you know, I work across two fields, the history of the human sciences and the history of technology. And I just, you know, have continually returned to this well. And so in trying to think about composite case, you know, there had been something that had been eating at me for a really long time. It's in my first book on teletherapy. It's in the kind of perimeter of a lot of my work, which is the use of children in psychoanalysis, especially in sort of the Ur tradition of of the first generation in which there were ostensibly, or so the received history goes, no children present, with the exception of little Hans, Freud's one child patient. And, you know, having done a lot of work on little Hans and really learning about how his treatment came to be and the fact that it was done in Coterie, you know, I began to be like, okay, where are the other children of psychoanalysts in that first generation before we get Melanie Klein and Anna Freud turning to child analysis, and at which point then there are children for days. And the next logical place to look was about and in Anna Freud, who very famously was Freud's patient and his child, though she was no longer a child when she was in treatment, though she, she was a young adult. And so I, I had an intellectual problem, which is what to make of the fact 
that there were children everywhere, but they were disavowed, with the exception of little Hans. And what that means for a method and for the small stories psychoanalysis uses to universalize uh, to the, quote, you know, ostensibly universal psyche and to th- rethink the criticism of psychoanalysis. Oh, well, it's just about, you know, the end of the bourgeois family in Vienna. And be like, actually, it's even worse than that. It's a really specific subset of people who are, are the engine of the child psyche as it's imagined. And it's not exactly, again, the received history been put through a time warp where we had adult patients and then we understood something about infancy and childhood through them. But in fact, a stitching together of adult patients with child observation before it could be avowed. So that became one part of that essay. And then I felt like I I wanted to. So here's where I feel like I have agency. I wanted to think about that operation in my life as the other component, what it means to be a child of analysts, of course, there are all these horrible myths about what happens to the children of analysts, that their myths is something I will say. But of course, there's always a, a grain of truth that children are driven mad by a particular kind of analytic attention in childhood. And wanted to think about why, like what is the role of the contemporary child of analysts? And it in fact has to do with this idea that Freud's back, you know, my parents did not experience Freud as being back. They experienced, right, being basically part of a ridiculed cult for science. And children will happily confirm for you, many children, their children, that Freud was an excellent observer of ch- children. And he just wrote that, that shit down, <laughs> right? And so children, as they work through Oedipality or, you know, as they work through their aggression, and there's Melanie Klein, will really show that the theory has something right. And then the child, of course, feels a kind of pressure to perform the theory. And that happened to Anna, right? The theory that was made on the grounds of her became the theory that she stewarded and protected, but also enacted for the rest of her life. And I wondered also about someone like me, and I could use me <laughs> as the example, right? Uh, and so both to be born into a lineage, the whole essay is about inheritance, but then to to rethink it and not just accept it as its own, you know, um, of course it is my parents' Freud and my parents' client. It's also not. It's a different moment. The exigencies of what the clinic needs and what social thought need are different. Um, something that, you know, institutional analysis is massively grappling with. And so that became the kind of topography for thinking this essay, but also more work beyond it. Thank you so much. Um, Alex, I have a question for you that is, I mean, in some ways it is also about your your piece for for the first issue of Paris. It's, it's about about fathers, but I, in particular, I mean, I, I mean, a lied father and Lacan and like the nom du pair here for, for a moment. But you are the first um, person we've had on on the podcast who is in the the clinical space. Right, Patrick and I are not. Hannah is a historian, um, and one of the things that I would really like to for us to do in general is get to talk to folks about their particular sorts of um, orientation. I guess you could say. Um, my sense is that you're you're a pretty committed Lacanian. Is that is that is that a good? Is that is that so? I, I got that right. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Okay. I, I- I often say I often say I'm a faithless Lacanian. Okay, will you tell us a little bit about the faithlessness of your Lacanianism, or a, a little bit about you know what you find compelling about Lacan? Something about I, I guess I'll just like say like I will make a like broad gesture into you and your relationship to Lacan as as a figure, whether as a theoretician or a clinician, and and ask you about your fidelity and your faithlessness. Well, there's a there's a kind of there's a hidden premise to the piece that, that I wrote about fathers, which is that if you talk to certain uh, institutionally prominent Lacanians, they will often traffic in this idea, quite complex, which is that there's a decline in the paternal function that has made doing Lacanian psychoanalysis harder, and has led to what they argue is a kind of like ordinarily psychotic social texture, and that is a very complicated way of saying that there is uh, 
far more emphasis on self-sufficiency, autonomy, and um, self-reliance. That is because the father, as a function, has declined historically. Um, for my part, I think of that actually as a um, subtextual admission on the part of Lacanians that their father, their father figure, has been in decline in terms of psychoanalytic practice and institutional influence. That is to say, Lacan doesn't quite doesn't ha quite have the same salience as he once did in like 1974, for instance. Um, and so I wanted to rethink that as like, what would it, what are people talking about when they talk about the decline of fathers generally as a social symptom? And what does that mean for psychoanalytic practice? And what that means for me personally in a clinical orientation is that like, I find it kind of boring when people just reproduce Lacanian aphorisms or formulas or like ways of, or ways of doing clinical work or techniques without much adherence to the particular historical setting that you've inherited Lacan in, and then also the particular setting of just like you're dealing with patients who might not know anything about Lacan or scansion or punctuation or anything like that. You know, one of the professors at Duquesne where I'm at once said to me quite helpfully that, you know, a lot of Lacanians, who people who practice, you know, in a Lacanian style, people go to them because they're Lacanians and they want that kind of treatment, you know? So for me, it's not good enough really to be a clinician who's just strictly a Lacanian because you're just going to get patients who want that kind of treatment. I'm far more open at, in terms of my orientation and practice to different, to, to listening to the patient, what they want from analysis or they want from a clinical encounter. And that might not entail Lacanian technique whatsoever. Um, I think there are some advantages to it. And I think there are forms of treatment that like really do work well if you take up a Lacanian register and technique. But the idea that that just works universally for everybody, you know, irrespective of what they profess to want from a clinical encounter doesn't, that seems to me to be quite naive. Um, so, so anyways, that piece is trying to kind of do both where it's just like trying to talk about a social, a psychosocial symptom. But I think it's also trying to talk about like, you can't just go in as a clinician and try to uh, impose the father function. That the father function actually is is it's structural. That's a Lacanian premise, and it structures everyone. No one can be the father figure as understood in um, the Freudian model, which is the primal father who you know is is transgressive and no no law applies to them and you know, um, that, that cl clinicians shouldn't operate with the idea that that is what they should embody. I'm not saying they all, they think that, but if, if you do think that, I think that's, is perverse and strange. And I think it's, um, it's a, it's a, it is a fantasy, I think, uh, especially an, especially masculine fantasy of like the knowing therapist who comes in and like, can, can tell you what's what. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so I have one more question for, and this one's for for everybody. And I should say that I'm asking it um, because listeners have been asking us for things to read. And personally, as as a, as somebody who's like work involves like cajoling people to read, like this is like extraordinarily delightful to me. Um, so I wanted to ask everybody if there, if you could offer up like a psychoanalytic text or text, multiple texts that, that most speak to you, like something that you return to again and again, um, and just tell us what that is and, and perhaps a little bit about uh, the, the force and, or nature of that return. I mean, I can, I can go on both sides, like primary and secondary texts. Yeah. Um, for historians of psychoanalysis, you know, I really am partial, still really, really love John Forrester's work. Um, uh, including with his his wife, um, Lisa Appenyezi, you know, Freud's Women. Yeah, I love that book. For not really work, but also Forrester has, it's just coming out in May, um, posthumously, six new lectures on, introductory lectures on psychoanalysis. And I would be very keen to read them if I was just coming to Freud, but I will be reading them as someone who's 
been been here for a minute um, and really think he's wonderful. I, I also think whenever Peter Gallison, rarely, but when he does, deals with psychoanalysis, it's must read, you know, really thinking about material and technological conditions that give rise to particular Freudian formulations. I find that stuff really interesting. Then again, I'm my own particular nerd. But in the kind of, um, you know, and also for thinking about how, you know, we keep saying Freud is back. But I think the other thing to say here is that it's not just Freud that's back. Like Fanon yeah. is back. Like there's a massive explosion of Fanon studies in the United States. I'm Absolutely. very curious about um, I think there's like an interesting uptick in people talking about beyond and Klein. Um, so, you know, I just, there are, you know, these sort of signal books of all of those people or pieces from all of those people. And I think we're seeing again on the historical side, how far ranging psychoanalysis really is beyond Freud. Uh, Daniel Gatston beads a, a people's history of, of psychoanalysis Camille Robsey's new book, Disalienation. These are great books. They're super apprehendable. They're beautiful. They're really important contributions in their recent um, their recent views on, on these questions. Um, and then I don't know, probably it's the same text that, that first got me that I probably reread the most, uh, Morning and Melancholia, you know, where Freud is really trying to, you know, in World War I, in the Great War, really think about what it means um, not just to have personal mourning or melancholia, but also social. Like it's that's the subtext. Um, and then I get stuck looking at every time Freud mentions money for my own work. So looking at you know, something I love in Freud is what a flexible thinker he is. Like tight fisted with drafts, totally controlling, really happy to admit when he's gone wrong. Yeah. So rare in in a God, right? To say, eh, you know, I've gotten all of this wrong. Let's go again. Um, let's be more precise. Let's revise. So looking at Freud's, you know, introductory lectures uh, on psychoanalysis for the recommendations on technique, all of these moments of revision in how he's going to set up the analytic clinic, including to make way for, you know, a massive movement for free psychoanalysis that, of course, you know, the Nazification ends. But th those are my go-tos. Thank you. That's that's amazing. And we will we will. Uh collect those up and, 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 and write them down for folks. Um, Alex, how about you? I'm, uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna play the audience a little bit. I think, um, me, my favorite Freud text is observations on transference love for sure. For all kinds of reasons. Um, one, because it has one of the better jokes in Freud that I really enjoy is where it's an amusing anecdote that he retells. <laughs> I read that in the last episode. <laughs> Oh, you did. Perfect. I yeah. was like, I really read too many quotations in the last episode. It's too long because I was like, no, you have to hear this. You have to hear this. I have to read it out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, yeah, the joke about the, the insurance agent who, you know, goes in and you've already sold it, but, you know. No, do it, do it, do it on your own. That's well, great. it's just it's just the person who, you know, the insurance agent, you know, is on his deathbed and, um, yeah, this family really wants him to convert. You know, it's it's fitting because it's Easter. Really wants them to convert, um, and the insurance the pastor comes to convert the insurance agent, and he and they're in there for a long time. And the family is like, "We got him, we got him. He's going to convert." Um, but then the pastor comes out, and he uh, he's got a, he's got a life insurance policy <laughs> instead. And it's um, funny every time. <laughs> it's a good joke, but I think, but I think I think about it a lot because it's. To hear, to hear the flip side of what I just said, actually, about like listening to what the patient wants. There is a way that you you can't quite capitulate to that as a clinician. You can't quite give over entirely to the secondary gain of someone petitioning you for care. That there's a, there is a level of aloofness and impersonality that's necessary for the work to happen. You know, you're not their friend. You know, you're not their father. You're not their mother you are an, an impersonal function for them just as much as you are a, a flesh and blood person. And I think balancing those two things is for Freud, the same thing as balancing the problem of transference love and real love. And that you can work with transference love, but to enact it as a real love is far more dicey um, and it should be avoided. That being abstemious as an analyst is necessary for the work to happen. That you can't actually enact it, and that, and that analysts and therapists who try, whether because of a bleeding heart or because of their own shit, 
like try to just like cure absolutely, you know, or like be the person for them that they, that their patient didn't have in their life or whatever, that actually just makes things worse. And there's something, there's an ethical valence to that text that really speaks to the heart of the problems and, and, and the psychotherapeutic encounter that I think cannot be forgotten. Um, which is that as much as it, as much as therapy delves into the personal, it's not quite the same thing as like being someone's friend or lover or parent or whatever, that there's a distinction that should be made and maintained. Um, and that is on some level, just the measure of what we call neutrality. Um, and that is the whole can of worms and it's complex and it's paradoxical and we should talk, you, you, you should do an episode on it or something, you know, but I, but I think that, that knowing how to parse the difference between transference, love and real love, even though Freud had a hard time doing that himself, keeping that question open, um, is I think important clinically, but I think it's also important in life, um, in some respects, getting a sense of someone's fantasies about you and your fantasies to them and not let, not having that override or bowl over the other person, you know, or, or, or vice versa being totally entrapped in someone else's fantasy of you. It's a really complicated process. Um, it's like, and it's quintessentially psychoanalytic. Um, in my second, as far as secondary sources go, I mean, my favorite, one of my favorite essays is, um, where does the misery come from by Jacqueline Rose, which is, you know, it's about the death drive and it's about, you know, it's about Jeffrey Masson and it's about, you know, this, it's about the history of psychoanalysis and trying to dissolve the psyche into the social and where there's a similar kind of paradoxical um, enigma at work, which is like, why is it that the psyche doesn't quite translate totally into the social and why does the social not quite totally translate into the psyche and that is the point of the foundation and it's the point of the the magazine and so thinking about those those things you know for me which is like love and work same like you know love and society and where the psyche doesn't it's just kind of this obstacle um as much as it is the the means Thank you so much, Patrick. In ter- it's really just an embarrassment of riches, and, that, and and listening to you both list things that are meaningful to you, I'm like, oh, I should I should just say that. Blah, blah, blah. Like, <laughs> I keep on adding to the things. Um, I mean, primary stuff. I, I I go back to the Freud case histories all the time. I think they're they're beautiful. The early ones in particular, are beautiful. I kind of love Dora as like a little modernist novel that I think benefits from rereading and rereading and rereading. And get very, and part of it is also you know the the pleasure of or even like the, it's pain, it's a painful pleasure, but it's still a pleasure of like encountering Freud when he fucks up and owns it. Like there's something very, I think there's something uh, properly inspirational, even when it's infuriating about someone who is so committed to reproducing and publishing their null results, right. And publishing their failures. Like that's just not something that is incentivized in general, right. In, in contemporary sciences, of course not, right. People don't reproduce experiments, experiments, let alone like describe experiments that failed but but there's something about that i think is it has a kind of like uh you know try fail try better fail better type of logic to it that i find very inspirational i i love the later freud stuff i mean i think there's some bits in civilization of discontents and you know and in, in analysis internal and terminable that are uh that speak to some of the dynamics i think we talked about a few minutes ago in terms of repetition and enactment on the social level but also on like the individual level of like what can you process or handle in a given lifetime or within the context of a given professional vocation, you know, as a clinician, as a therapist, as a political activist, whatever. Uh, and sort of like questioning the bandwidth of change there, I think is, is profoundly generative. Uh, in terms of secondary things, I mean, I also have commitments to certain Lacanian thinkers. Like I think Malcolm Bowie's little book on Lacan is just absolutely gorgeous. Like every line in that is, I was, looking for it. And then I realized I lent it to someone and I don't have it anymore, but, but every line in that is beautiful and he's a wonderful stylist. Uh, I'm very indebted to one of my dissertation mentors, Shoshana Feldman. I think her work on, on that is uh, on Lacan and on like the structural stuff about pedagogy and knowledge is really useful. And that interfaces with some of the things we were talking about uh, in our first episode about like the subject who is supposed to know, or the subject who is presumed to know. I think there's, there's something in the way that, 
uh, Shoshana works with uh, the, the example of Socrates, but also like the idea of the Lacan as like this, this sort of absolute master who actually kind of abdicates certain types of responsibilities and sets things in motion. That's, that, that's very meaningful to me. I, I think similarly about some work by Patricia Garavici and, and others that I think is, you know, in the Lacanian tradition and has, has sort of legs, so to speak. I think the other thing I, I find very helpful, and I, I, this is another, this I suppose dates me for people who are ca- tracking these things, but some of the, 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 the critical theory from the 90s and early 2000s explicating Freud and Lacan can be very helpful, I think, vis-a-vis certain questions. I, I was actually looking through, and I, I brought it up, I, I don't need to read the paragraph in question, but I, I brought up some stuff by Jonathan Culler from like the, the early 2000s, I think reprinted from the 90s. And it's what this focuses on specifically, and this is from his, uh, his Pursuit of Science book, is this idea of uh, how Freudian, how Freudian perspective or psychoanalytic perspective more broadly inverts the ways in which we understand causality to work, right? Um, in the sense that like, well, Oedipus becomes when does Oedipus become Oedipus, right? Like in the classic Sophocles play, right? Does he, does he do it when he kills his dad or when he realizes that he killed his dad, right? Or does he do it when he blinds himself a colonist, right? This is this idea that like you, you step into roles and only after you've stepped into it and then recognize it, do you sort of like retroactively constitute yourself in those terms? I, I think that there's something about like the logic of the symptom or the logic of like the way things are and I guess what I'm, what I'm dancing around here is another favorite for, for a text, which is actually Totem and Taboo, right? And the stuff about the primal father. Like, I think that that idea of like reacting against that, you know, transgressive monster dad, right? That, that Alex was just talking about. Uh, I think that that's a, that has political traction in the present moment, but also is, you know, Freud uses it to understand Christianity among other things on, on this wonderful Easter. I think it has some traction there too, but it's also one of those things that speaks to the power of certain narratives to produce outcomes or produce sort of very stable and even uh, determinative structures in the world that we understand ourselves by and kind of can find ourselves replicating whether we like it or not. And in that context, you have either the option of being like, well, this is not, these aren't true. These are meaningless. We move beyond them being determined by them by being like, well, we won't repeat this. We'll never repeat that. We're going to, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to be like the, the destiny assumed has to end to be by my parents. I, re, I will reject it every moment. I won't let it control me. Well, guess what? You just let it control you. Like, like by doing that nonstop, you, you do that. Or the third option, which is like a kind of like a, a recognition of your situatedness of the things that you inherit and your limits uh, in that light, but then not choosing to relate to those relationships differently as a sort of a third option. Um, I'll post the quote in, in the Patreon link for people who want to see it, but, but it is this idea that somehow we are a lot of everyday life and a lot of ideological formation um, involves logics of identification that you don't even necessarily know you're doing and that are about inverting the actual sequence of events of things as they happen to bring to bear narratives of who is to blame for a given problem, how did the thing happen, uh, what is to be done about the thing, uh, and you impose those frames on the thing that actually happened, right? This idea that the effect becomes the cause, right? And, and I, don't, I think you could just look at, you know, like the way a stand your ground case works or the fact that like a police officer yells, drop it after they've shot someone. And then the people, and like there's studies on this, people who've seen the shooting, they'll be like, oh yeah, he yelled it before you shot the person, right? This way in which events are, are, are beyond our easy calculus. They can be traumatizing. They can be upsetting. They are, they can be full of all of these contingencies and the way we mentally process them is by narrativizing them in ways that all, more often than not involve identifications with power and ratifications of the status quo. And that to me is a key feature of the Freudian enterprise and something I keep coming back to. Abby, I'll throw it back to you. Sure. Um, well, I guess, for Freud, I have to say that, like, I have always been a huge fan of the interpretation of dreams. Um, I mean, it's it's like a big, sprawling, baggy monster of a book, and I love it. Um, there was, like, a time where I, like, read it once. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, 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 it uh, rewards visitation and revisitation. I want to also throw out a book, and, and uh, I know, actually, Dan loves this book, um, which is uh, 
think Hannah brought up Wilfred Beyond earlier, but I love Beyond's book Experiences in Groups. That was one of those um, one of those books that I read, and afterwards I was like, oh, I can never understand the the phenomenon of people of like more than two people in a room the same. Um, you know, there's this this general idea that like there is a, a stated purpose of any given group, but what is actually functioning, like what is actually at work is a vastly different sort of purpose. And, uh, you know, that that was that was a really mind blowing book for me. Um, and, and I think finally, um, when we get to secondary literature, I want to throw something out that's like a little bit um, this doesn't position itself as psychoanalytic criticism, but I think is also like a just beautiful example of psychoanalytic criticism, which is Jordi Rosenberg's essay, Gender Trouble on Mother's Day, which which is about Judith Butler, who, um, you know, certainly is, is is working on on and with people with many psychoanalytic commitments. Um, and I will I will restrain myself from like reading this entire gorgeous essay out loud. But I will say that, you know, at, at the end, um, he invokes Lacan and and glosses this 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 line about um, and this is a quote having some kind of commitment to that which fissures the otherwise seamless appearance of sense. Um, close quote. <laughs> um, but like every every line of this of this essay, which also just toggles back and forth again between like the intellectual and the visceral in this way that I find to be so unbelievable. So that's something that I, I would want to, um, to offer. I mean, on that point, Abby, I mm -hmm. just, you know, and, and Jonathan Culler has this other essay about Oedipus too, which is that, I mean, you know, Oedipus is, what is Oedipus a victim of? I mean, and, and, you know, he's a victim of his own paranoid attempt to make sense of himself, of the force of narrative cohesion that makes him Oedipus, right? The city of Thebes has a political curse cast upon it. And all these horrid symptoms are plaguing Thebes. And at first he's cast as the hero who's going to save Thebes. But in him recognizing that there is a curse and the oracle gives him the prophecy of his own place in that, he scrambles in many respects to make sense of it by making himself the reason for the curse. He wants to make sense of it. And in that way, he becomes a he becomes um puppeted by his own neurosis of a sense of destiny, of making too much sense out of the situation. And I think that fissure of like reintroducing nonsense into one's life, into one's own sense of neuroses, is itself the therapeutic act. It's not about reducing your symptoms to something you can make sense out of per se something different than that. Um, Alex, Hannah, thank you both so much for joining us today. It's, it is, has always been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. Can I, can I ask a question on behalf of audience members who might want to know how they could get a copy of the first issue of Parapraxis or oh, be, yeah. uh, Definitely looped ask into that question. other developments, how they could perhaps enroll in such classes mm -hmm. or, you know, like otherwise be, be hip to exciting events, whether or not Freud is back or just returning like the repressed or he's always been there and now we're re-encountering him in an uncanny way or who knows? People just want to vibe with this stuff. You saying so be hip to is yeah. a little bit of an uncanny yeah. Yeah. There, There are a few ways. So, Parapraxis publishes both, you know, twice a year in print and online with some frequency, both web only and it's it's um, print content. So you can go to parapraxismagazine.com. There you can find links to subscribe. So issue two coming this summer on repair, uh, issue three coming this winter on wishing. And, uh, and then also over at the Psychosocial Foundation, you can sign up for courses or seminars. You, we both these things have mailing lists and they both have Twitters so long as tweeting works. So we, we'd love to see you there. Um, we, I think, feel very lucky when we meet all together. It feels like a really wonderful community and it is, is truly an open one. Thank you so much. We will put all of these things in the show notes. Thank you so much. Thank you. You guys were wonderful. Thank you, truly. This has been an episode of Ordinary Unhappiness, a podcast about psychoanalysis, politics, pop culture, and the ways we suffer now. 
I'm Abby Kluchin, and today I was joined by Patrick Blanchfield, Hannah Zeven, and Alex Colston. This podcast is produced by Danny Owl. Theme music by Formal Chicken.